Hi guys, I am so, so excited to share with you a huge journey that I'm going on through life. This will be to have a hair and eyebrow transplant. I will be having this surgery shortly with a company called Get More Hair, who are based in the UK and will be traveling to Istanbul in Turkey for my surgery. As you may be aware, I have battled with my hair for so, so many years. I wanted to share with you my thoughts, feelings, findings and feedback around having a hair transplant surgery as a female. It's something that a lot of men talk about. There are lots of different hair systems available for men, from tattooing the scalp, to taking injections, vitamins, shampoos, hats, toupees, hair pieces. Lots of different things that people are able to talk and try about as men, as we look at male pattern boldness in the media. But actually when it comes to women, we don't talk about hair in the same way and it really does dent your confidence and make a huge difference to how you look and feel when hair starts to thin, recede or fall out completely. Now the issues that I've had with my hair, the fact that my heritage is Hungarian, my father lost his hair at the age of 21, my brother crept until his 30s when the last piece just dropped out and my mum has very fine thin hair where you can see her scalp. So put that together as a combination and I have very flyaway, very thin, wispy hair. My scalp is partly visible and due to a cow's lick, I can never have a fringe because my hair grows in the wrong direction and parts my fringe, which is so, so frustrating. Add into the mix the fact that I am a number seven on the hair colour chart, so that's classified as a dark blonde. I'm neither blonde or brunette. So having to lighten or darken my hair, when I darken my hair, my roots are too light. When I lighten my hair, my roots are too dark. I find that I look quite washed out with dark hair. So I tend to lighten my hair. And over the years, I have bleached it into oblivion. It's killed the quality and texture and weight of the hair. It breaks off and just feels so, so awful. Add into the mix that go into the gym, I wash my hair far more than most people would, sometimes twice a day at times due to the sweat from working out. I tie it up, it pulls back in ponytails and creates this receding at the sides of the hair. Um, having two children at the ages of 20 and 25, handfuls of hair came falling out, stress, um, you know, going into the shower and just seeing all of this hair at the base of the shower is so, so heartbreaking and, and concerning as a woman. Um, I found that for a very long time I would have long hair and try everything not to cut it, not to touch it. I don't use hair straighteners, I don't use hair dryers, I try not to damage my hair, I brush it very softly, I tie it back in a low ponytail so as not to pull at the top of it anymore. You kind of learn these, these mistakes as you go. Um, I use Olaplex shampoo to condition my hair and keep it strong, a, a bond maintenance. Over the years I have had hair extensions which have torn my hair and at times plucked my hair, which is quite scary, almost waxing the scalp where they're, where they're pulled out and caught. Um, I then turned from bleach to henna hair dye which gave me beautiful orange hair. My hair was glossy and, and thickened up and felt so much healthier. But actually, because I couldn't lighten my hair um, to blonde in between hennering my hair, my hair became very dark and I looked very washed out and not myself. So I returned to blonde um, a couple of years ago, which was a long and slow and gradual process, which has once again damaged my hair to lift the darkness of the colour. Where I stand now, I have my natural hair colour creeping through and I'm no longer doing a full head of blonde highlights. I'm literally just sticking to the T-section, allowing the bleach to grow out and chopping off the ends. This is the shortest my hair has been in years um, and I'm gradually seeing that it's getting stronger. But when I look at a hair transplant surgery, my reasons for wanting it, Firstly is because my forehead is quite prominent, um, especially when I always have my hair tied back, 
I have a large expanse of skin here. Um, you know, it's down to the individual how you feel about your own hair. I'm not here saying that a large forehead is unattractive or undesirable or that you should seek to change that. Simply this is a decision that I have made for myself that I feel I have this large expanse of forehead and I'm unable to grow a fringe because of the direction of my natural follicles. So they point backwards and kink up. So I always have my hair the same length, um, grown up, just long and lifeless. So recently I've had my hair cut shorter and I've had the front shortened ever so slightly to give me shape in preparation for cutting a fringe in prior to having my hair transplant surgery. This is to slightly cover and disguise but I will have my healing process. Uh, there will be scabbing and there will be shorter hair growing through as the follicles bed in and find their new placement in my hairline. So hair can be transplanted to where the muscles end on the head. So if you crinkle your forehead, where you see the top and final line is where you are able to take the hair to. So for this reason, I will be able to have around a finger to a finger and a half, one to one and a half centimeters of hair added across my hairline. So it won't be a massively dramatic difference. It's not like I'm having inches added, but it will make the difference to the direction of my hair. So this will take my forehead slightly lower, the hairline on my forehead, and will also allow me to fill in the sides of my hair, where this receding takes place through tugging and tying up hair. Even when we tie our hair in towels, bath towels, we wrap them in a kind of turban and pull them up. Over the years, this pulls and weakens and removes hair follicles from this area around the head. So I will be having a, a natural hairline created for around a finger's width all the way along and filling the sides to give more thickness and fullness. This will also allow the hair follicles to point downwards. This will give me a fringe and also help to disguise the rest of my forehead. So it's not about having lots and lots of hair because what we'll be doing is taking a donor section from the back of the head and bringing those follicles, my natural hair follicles, to the front and sides. Naturally, where we have our ears on our head, we have less hair at the front of our face anyway, because we are missing this much compared to around the back. So I always find my hair is quite fly away and wispy, but adding this extra hair here will bring more weight, more density and thickness. Now to improve this also, because my hair is naturally quite fine and fly away, this can't be treated with surgery because the hair follicles that I have then transplanted to the front will be the same quality of hair that I already have on my head. So to thicken, strengthen and vitalize hair, another process will be used where stem cells will be taken from me and re-injected back into my scalp to almost act as a compost or a growth vitamin booster and thicken and strengthen my natural hair so that it stays longer and is a lot more healthy and vibrant itself. This in turn will help to increase the coverage of my hair to make it a better quality, taking away the bleach and nutrients to my scalp will really make a difference to how my hair is quite thin and fine and my scalp is visible at times. So when we look at the hairline of the hair, Men tend to recede in this circle at the top and in male pattern boldness. But for women, we have this strip along the parting that widens outwards. When this happens, you can either lose your hair follicle completely and have that boldness, or the hair follicles that you have can just become very thin and fine and you are able to see through them. When the hair is thin and fine, this means the follicle is still there. So hair transplant surgery will not change that because it's the quality of the hair that you must tackle and not the fact that there aren't follicles because it's still growing. So you want to look to make your hair, your scalp, your health as strong as possible, looking at hair vitamins and supplements and also treatments like the stem cell treatments that I will be having also to help get the best results from this surgery. So looking at this treatment and procedure, 
the main concerns that I had was the healing process and the results that I can achieve. I've done so, so much research online, looking at before and after photos, looking at reviews from the clinic. And actually the reason I chose Get More Hair is because they are based in the UK where I am. They're very shortly away from my home, which is perfect. And they've actually worked with many people that I know, as well as celebrities in the media. So to know that they have performed successful, wonderful hair transplants on people that can personally recommend them is a massive advantage for me because I know that I can actually inspect those results and feel comfortable and confident that I would like the same for myself. Now naturally we are all individuals so what one person achieves might not be the same as what another person achieves and that's why it's so important to speak through your expectations prior to surgery. My expectations are to improve on what I have, not to be perfect. I know that I will never look like Claudia Winkleman as much as I would love to, but I can improve what is naturally there for me and make the best of these results. Now, a massive thing that people talk about when it comes to hair transplant surgery is the recovery period and being able to conceal the fact that maybe you've had hair transplant surgery. It's something that can be very difficult for self-confidence and you might not want other people to know or see the healing process that that's involved. There are many different options available to conceal the healing process where possible. It's advised that for the first week you don't touch your hair at all, you do not cover it or put anything that can cause friction or abrasion to the hair because this is where the scabs will be. Once the scabs come off around a week to 10 days, maybe two weeks maximum, you're then able to wear loose fitting things over the head. Now I've deliberately chosen to have my surgery in the winter so that I can have the majority of my healing process when people are naturally covering their hair with hats and scarves and hoods because it's raining and it's cold outside. So for me, I felt that in the summer it would be harder to hide the fact that I've had a hair transplant, but in the winter it's quite fashionable to cover your hair. So I have a range of loose fitting hats, head scarves and bands and I also have a neck cushion, a neck support like an airline pillow which is essential for your recovery to help you to sleep and to prevent any bangs and knocks to your head. The back of the head will be shaved in a section, a strip taken from your natural hair and this will also need to heal as the follicles are taken one by one and put into the front of your hairline. Now I'm having the smallest package available because I don't have a large expanse to cover and also because I'm limited by where my facial muscles naturally fit. So I can go up to the top line here, but not beyond that. You cannot stitch a hair follicle into a facial muscle. So it's knowing about where your natural anatomy begins and ends and what the results can be for you. So I'm going to be blogging the entire process in my video diaries here on YouTube and also in my blog at tracykiss.com. I'll be posting on social media and taking your questions and comments and providing answers and feedback and sharing my honest experience and approach to this in its absolute entirety. I'm also hoping if possible to be able to film during the surgery itself to show you step by step what is involved that I may have signal to be able to live stream my surgery and if that's possible I will do so on social media. The idea being that I want to remove the stigma around female hair loss, around hair loss in general because only a handful of years ago hair transplants were not available for women. It was a male industry where I guess for men it's a massive massive thing that hair is constantly on show and for women we are a lot more comfortable wearing hair extensions and wigs but actually putting off the problem doesn't deal with it. Opening up that conversation understanding and educating ourselves in what is available to us and what can help makes such a difference and we can break down the stigma associated with hair loss look at the reasons why hair loss happens what treatments are available surgical and non-surgical and how you can live with thinning and loss of hair so i hope that you might find my diary helpful i hope that you will share this experience with me and see that 
it is very heartfelt and not the easiest thing for me to share, to be able to be vulnerable and show this healing process and something that is a massive, massive life choice for me. I hope that it might bring you comfort should you be feeling or living with the same symptoms that I feel. Definitely with age, it has become more prominent part of my life. Um, and when I was younger my hair was so thick and, and bouncy and wonderful and I've just destroyed it over the years. Parenthood, age, lifestyle really does play a massive toll and you know where we're once young and, and everything grows perfectly, does as it's told, that doesn't always stay in our lives um, and it's quite hard to let go of something that we were once very comfortable with. So hopefully in sharing this you can see my real results, my real account and journey that I go through. So here begins my journey from the process of booking my surgery to leaving for my surgery. Um, it's been so informative. I've had a video call with my surgeon. To start with, I had to take photos of my hair and explain what I hope to achieve and the target areas that were an issue for me. I was then able to be determined whether I'd be a successful or unsuccessful candidate for hair transplant surgery because it's not for everybody and surgeons will turn you away if they believe that you cannot achieve the results that you desire. So it's about managing your expectations and actually going to somebody who has expertise in that field. The reason that I'm having this surgery abroad in Istanbul is because Istanbul is world famous for hair transplant surgery. The surgeon that I'm using has so much experience and the clinic is UK based. So all of those things together tick those boxes for me. As I say, I personally know people who have had surgery at this clinic and are very, very happy with their results. It has literally been life changing for them. And that gives me that confidence to know that I can achieve similar myself. I then had a Zoom call with my surgeon to be able to ask questions and find out any information that I needed to know. This was primarily around the thinning of my hairline, as I usually wear my parting to one side, just because the thinnest part of my hair is straight down the center, which happens with female hair thinning. To know that actually the quality of my hair can be improved and that vitamins and injections are available, this tackles this problem for me and helps me to thicken and enrich the hair that I naturally have, as well as adding those follicles to the target areas to bring a, a fullness to around my face and to also cover my forehead with a fringe. So I'm so, so excited about that. I'm booking my flights now, um, my travel insurance, and then leaving for the airport, that's all I have to do. Everything is taken care of. Once I touch down in Istanbul, I will be collected from the airport, taken to my hotel, which is organized by the clinic, taken to and from my appointments, to my surgery, um, and I have no concern or worry in the world. It's from the second I land to the second I get back on the plane to come home, it's all taken care of by the clinic. It's worth making sure what is expected of you as a patient for your aftercare. Because the surgeon's job itself, the work that they do, the results that they achieve can be undone if you fail to maintain and follow their aftercare instructions. A lot of people after surgery can develop infections if they are unhygienic or fail to clean the area properly. If they return to smoking, results can be minimized because you are not healing as well as you could. Drinking alcohol, partying, not sleeping properly, rubbing the area, wearing tight and restricted clothing, all of these things can make a massive difference on your final results. So it's important that you understand you can book the time off work that is necessary and that you can follow the aftercare steps properly and professionally the entire way through. It's not about just taking care for the first week, but actually understanding that it is a process of recovery. And that starts the second that you leave the hospital. So hopefully I can share with you my recovery process, that you can see this window and timeline of what to expect and to understand if it's achievable for yourself. 
Now I'm looking at my results, my final, final results to start taking place between six to 18 months, which may seem like a very long time. But across this time, the hair will continue to grow and thicken. It will start to come through as baby hairs to start with, which in this area of the fringe will look quite natural. I'm going to be wearing hair bands, loose hair bands to conceal that, and also having a fringe cut in this week of my natural fringe, which is gonna be quite thin and exposed, but will slightly disguise the fact that I will have this band of healing here. So looking at these results, I will show a weekly, monthly update and progress with before and after pictures so that you can see precisely how long my hair has taken to grow. Some people's hair grows extremely fast, some people's hair grows extremely slow. And that really is down to diet, lifestyle, and genetics for yourself as an individual. But hopefully you will be able to see my progress and my journey. I'm really, really excited for the surgery itself. It's gonna be nice when it's raining and it's cold and gray here to fly to beautiful Istanbul, to have some nice meals with my partner, uh, my surgery at the clinic do a bit of sightseeing afterwards and fly home rested, ready to recover. I'm briefly touching on the fact that I will be having an eyebrow transplant. The reason that I'm having this is because the inner edges of my eyebrows are non-existent. I've had my eyebrows tattooed for around several years now to fill in where the hair has naturally been plucked away. Years ago, it was very fashionable to pluck hair into a very thin and fine line, where most of it has regrown as fashion has developed into a thicker, fuller brow. I've actually lost the inner corners of my eyebrows here. So I wear eyebrow pencil and powders every day, as well as having my eyebrows tattooed. Whilst I'm having my hair transplant surgery, they also offer eyebrow transplants. So it makes sense for me to do these two things at the same time. This involves transplanting follicles into the center of my eyebrows here, as this is the area where I have experienced hair loss through over plucking over the years. I will share with you every step of the way from here on out. And if you do have any questions, I welcome you to ask them in the comment section below and I will do my best to answer them either in the comments or as part of my next video. My fringe is getting cut this week and I'm so nervous because I haven't had a fringe since I was so, so young, but I'm hoping that it is the first step to where I hope to be this time next year with my full and final results. So stay tuned for what is to come and remember to keep up to date with all of the extensive details and pictures and information on my blog at www.tracykiss.com and I will see you all soon.